Enligt de mexikanska krönikerna har människorna existerat långt innan den här världen kom till. Och livet på jorden har uppstått och gått under flera gånger. Time evolves and comes to a place where it renews again. There is first a purification time, then there is renewal time. We are getting very close to this time now. För cirka 5 miljarder år sedan svävade planeten jorden som ett livlöst klot genom rymden. Det gick nästan en miljard år innan livet uppstod och enligt den etablerade vetenskapen har den mänskliga civilisationen bara existerat i några hundratusentals år. Men hur mycket vet vi egentligen om vårt avlägsna förflutna? Einstein sa en gång att mötet med det hemlighetsfulla är ursprunget till all vetenskap. Därför ska vi nu bege oss in i mytologins gåtfulla universum och söka svar på några av livets stora frågor. Varifrån kommer vi? Och vart är vi på väg? En legend berättar att Amerikas ursprungliga invånare var överlevande från en högt utvecklad civilisation som utplånades efter en global översvämning. I Mexiko har man hittat steninskriptioner som berättar att världen har drabbats av en rad stora naturkatastrofer. De gamla ruinerna står kvar och vittnar om en högt utvecklad kultur som gick under. Medan myten om tidigare tiders civilisationer lever vidare bland de få ursprungliga indianer som finns kvar idag. Det är dags att vi lyssnar till vad de har att berätta. We were told that we would see America come and go. And in a sense, America is dying from within because they forgot the instructions on how to live on Earth. ancient history and any more than a year from now is too far away to be relevant. Suddenly the world has become very connected. Now I can move from any part of it to any part of it in less than a day. I can pick up my phone and I can talk to anyone. I can look on the internet and look at what literally millions of people are doing all over the world. It's a very different kind of society we have now, and it's changing people. För 25 år sedan avstod Charles Lawrence från en lovande karriär som affärsman i New York och lät sig adopteras av en gammal hopindian kvinna, Carolyn Tawangiama. The elders here on Hopi, they had a vision that somewhere long time ago, call it past lives if you want to, that I had helped the Hopi, that I'd been kind of a, uh, an outcast from my own tribe. In one way, I was at the peak of, uh, or approaching the peak of a very fine place career-wise in New York City. My officer was in the Plaza Hotel. Um, It's so funny as we change perspectives of life. A lot of what I was doing before looks like it was just a, a skeleton dancing in the wind. You know, had very little substance to it. In hindsight, I think, here I am, this orange picker kid from California, you know. How did this get to happen for me? I just had no sense that this was even in the dance card. 
You know, this was their offering for life. Det indianska ordet Hopi betyder fred. En legend berättar att Hopi-indianerna var de första som kom till Amerika där de i många generationer levde som nomader innan de slog sig ner i Arizona och grundade Oriaby som är den äldsta boplatsen i USA. Legenden berättar att det var just på den här platsen som profeten Massau år 1100 visade sig för Hopi-indianerna för första gången och gav dem tillåtelse att bosätta sig på den invigda jorden. Massau sa till dem att de var ett utvalt folk och innan han lämnade jorden igen gav han dem några stentavlor med teckningar och symboler som beskriver mänsklighetens historia och framtid. I nästan tusen år har Hopi-indianerna bevarat de gamla stentavlorna men det är kanske först nu som vi kan börja förstå vad de gamla profetierna betyder. The people of the first world named Tokpila, meaning endless space, were of four different colors and they spoke different languages. Yet they felt as one and understood each other. But then came among them Lavo Hoya, the talker. He convinced them of the differences between people due to the color of their skins. People began to divide and to fight one another. Only a few still lived by the laws of creation. To them came the creator's nephew, Satuknang. He led them to a big mount where the ant people lived. When they were all safe and settled with the ants, fire came from above and below, until all was one element, fire. And there was nothing left except the people safe inside the womb of the earth. This was the end of Tokpila, the first world. I think all cultures have had stories about um, the civilizations that they came from and the continuity in a sense with the past. I mean that is in some sense what culture is, is continuity with the past. I think it's a relatively recent thing that we're obsessed with the present. I think so much has happened in our lifetimes that we tend to think of current events as being much more important than, than history. In 91 years, you've seen a lot of things happen. I think that we are in one of the most critical turning points in the life of humanity. And I know that because it is so uncertain and we don't know the future, um, it's a time of anxiety for many people. I don't think that people have a sense right now what story they're a part of. They, they sense that uh, more that they're a part of a cataclysm. If, if one reads the Bible, there are some people who still do. Then in the Bible, there is an almost explicit promise. God made, made a promise that after the flood, is not going again to destroy the whole world. So and that, that is a great, I would say, great relief. On the other hand, it doesn't, it doesn't say, and nobody is promising it, that we won't do it on our own. Now we have, we have the technology. Now, the point is that atomic bombs are only one of the very of the very many means that we we people have in our disposal to destroy. Everything is coming to a time where prophecy and man's inability to live on earth in a spiritual way will come to a crossroad of great problems. It's the hope you believe, it's our belief that if you're not spiritually connected to the earth and understand the spiritual reality of how to live on earth, 
Most likely you will not make it. När den vita mannen för första gången gick i land i Amerika kom det inte som någon överraskning för hopindianerna. De visste nämligen från Massas profetier att människor av den vita rasen en dag skulle komma till deras land bärande på ett kors. De visste också att den vita mannens ankomst skulle markera övergången till en svår tid med splittring, våldsamma epidemier och blodiga krig. When Columbus came, that began what we term as the first world war. That was the true first world war when Columbus arrived. Because along with him came everybody from Europe. By the end of the second world war, we were in America, we were only 800,000 from 60 million to 800,000. So we were almost exterminated here in America. 1881 upprättade den amerikanska regeringen ett reservat som inskränkte hopindianernas territorium till mindre än en tiondel av deras ursprungliga område. Än en gång visade sig de gamla profetierna hålla sträck. Hopindianerna visste att det slutliga nederlaget skulle bli verklighet om den vita mannen lyckades omvända barnen och sätta dem upp mot deras föräldrar. Men deras motstånd tjänade ingenting till. Regeringen genomförde ett utbildningsprogram som gick ut på att ta barnen från deras föräldrar och placera dem på internatskolor långt hemifrån. Grandmother, like a lot of native children across the land here, was ripped out of her mother's arms at age six, she was taken away. The US soldiers came into these villages and without any concern to life or what they were doing, they just snatched children at any age and they were thrown in boxcars, train cars. It was just a, a very uh, educated form of genocide on one level that these teachers put these kids through. But grandma didn't see her folks for 17 years. She didn't come back to Hopi. Hopi-barnens påtvingade utbildning ledde så småningom till en inre splittring mellan de traditionella och de mer framstegsvänliga Hopi-indianerna. 1906 bröt konflikten ut på allvar och det slutade med att de traditionella Hopi-indianerna fördrevs från Oraibi. Det enda de fick med sig var de gamla profetiska stentavlorna. De slog sig ner vid en källa inte så långt från Oraibi där de grundade sin egen by, Hotvilla. Vid en högtidlig ceremoni lovade de varandra att hålla fast vid de gamla traditionerna och att offentliggöra massa av profetier och varningar för världen utanför. Caroline Tawangiyama, som hade lärt sig perfekt engelska under sin påtvingade skoltid, valdes till tolk för stammens äldsta. Grandma had a destiny to be a spokesperson. And she opened the doors for many, many Indian tribes around the earth to get their voice spoken in Geneva. I became a caretaker, a guardian during the travels of these elders. And then when I was traveling with Grandma, she would never leave here without sitting in council and the elders would pray for days what was to be said out in the world. And when the time came that she got so sick she couldn't couldn't come anymore. We went through actually a legal adoption, not just a ceremonial adoption, because I had to have papers signed by Carolyn Twanyama to say this is my this is my adopted son. I'm sending him here to speak on behalf of the traditional Hopi. After the first destruction, the survivors emerged to the second world, named Tokpa, meaning Dark Midnight.
They built villages and trails between them. They made things with their hands and stored food like the ant people. Everything they needed was on this second world. But they became greedy and began to quarrel and fight. Then wars between villages broke out. So again, Satuknang called upon the ant people to open up their world for the chosen ones. When they were safely underground, he ordered the twins, Pakwangahoya and Palongahoya, to leave their posts at the north and south end of the world axis. With no one to control it, the earth teetered out of balance, and as the world spun through cold and lifeless space, it froze into solid ice. This was the end of Tokpa, the second world. Now is an interesting time because we've really just gotten technology. And I mean just in the last hundred years or so, which is a moment of time, historically speaking. We actually have human artifacts that are 10,000 years old. They're pots, bits of baskets, things like that. So we know we can build things that last 10,000 years. The clock that I'm building is entirely mechanical. I actually have some faith that mechanical technology will be around for thousands of years, so people will, will be able to understand it and fix it. Whereas it may be that electronic technology, for instance, will just be a passing fad. We really don't know anything about how well electronics lasts over, over those time periods. One of the questions that comes up when you design a clock that lasts for 10,000 years is what do you use for the calendar system? There are great differences in the calendrical systems of the various cultures on Earth. The Hebrew calendar is registering the year 5970 as of September 1999. They are approaching the so-called seventh millennium. The Chinese calendar is into the year 4650 something. They are within 40 years will be approaching their fifth millennium. The Islamic calendar only shows the year 1420. One advantage that ancient cultures had over, over us is that they watched the stars all the time. If you don't have electric lighting, things like the phase of the moon become very important. But there's good evidence that the Mayans got uh, very good at predicting eclipses. Maya-indianerna var otroligt skickliga astronomer. För tusentals år sedan kunde de beräkna planeternas banor med en precision som kan mäta sig med de mest avancerade moderna beräkningsmetoderna. It turns out that one of the only calendar systems which makes sense is the Mayan calendar system. An interesting thing is that that calendar too is about to come to the end of one of its very long cycles. I think the biggest mystery with the Maya calendar is uh, this 2012 date. In the Maya long count calendar, there is a large cycle of some 13 baktuns, which is a period of just over 5,000 years. And uh, Maya scholars know that this great cycle of Maya time is due to end on December 21st of 2012. Why did the Maya pick 2012? Why did the Maya pick... Uh, the December solstice of the year 2012 to end this vast cycle of time. The key to understanding is the astronomical fact that we are living in a time of rare astronomical alignment. This particular alignment that we're approaching um, happens once every 13,000 years. I think that we can understand these galactic dynamics by looking closely at the Vedic cosmology and their insight is that 13,000 years ago was the golden age and then we start moving through a period of uh, yugas or world ages uh, descending from the golden age through the silver age to the bronze age we are now in the iron age the darkest age Kali Yuga 
we have been moving further and further into darker epics and consciousness has been losing itself into materialism and darkness. We are living in the worst of all possible worlds in which there is still hope. The good news is that we are just about to turn the corner. The galactic alignment of 2012 is the end of descending Kali Yuga and we will turn the corner to begin the ascent phase towards the next golden age. A human being is something that, that is unique in that, that it has its, its, its legs on earth, but it has a, a head that at least can look at heaven. There is a, a period of old time in schools in which boys and girls are fighting each other and they, can't stand, they cannot stand each other. After some time, at least they stop doing it. See, they become interested. Now that is a, it's a, a change of face. I mean, you are moving from one face to another. Now, for, 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 a, for groups of people, not for individuals, for groups of people, to, to make these changes is a much, more, a much, much longer period. still in the religious struggles of human consciousness, but slowly moving towards the age of Aquarius in a so-called vacuum or change over from the influence of Pisces, which is basically religious. In the religion, you cannot have religion without devotee. Most people are not interested in understanding religion, they're interested in devoting themselves to religion. ago when they cut it. Now I see that in the cracks of the rock, plants are beginning to grow. Nobody put them there, but there were seeds fl flying all, all, all over, and some of them finds the most minor crack, and they begin to flourish. So, so in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, you, you'll see the green wall where there was a bare rock. spiritual. Everything has a spirit. Everything, everything was brought to you by the creator, the one creator. Some people call him God. Some people call him Buddha. Some people call him Allah. Some people call him other names. We call him Tonkashila, grandfather. few winters then we go to the spirit world 
the spirit world is, is more real than most of us believe. The spirit world is, is everything. The name of the third world was Koskursa, meaning forever lost. Once more, people spread out. They multiplied in large numbers, advanced rapidly and created big cities, countries, a whole advanced civilization. But then they began to use their creative power in a destructive and evil way. They constructed a pat of water, a shield made of hide, and made it fly through the air. Using Patuwotas as weapons, they attacked one another. Something had to be done. Satuknang instructed the Chosen Ones to cut down some tall plants with hollow stems, crawl inside and seal them up. Then he released the water upon the earth. Waves higher than mountains rolled upon the land. Continents broke asunder and sank beneath the seas. Finally, the movements ceased. When opening the seals, the people saw that they were on a little piece of land on top of the highest mountain. All else, as far as they could see, was water. On the bottom of the ocean, proud cities were resting. Worldly treasures were destroyed by the evils of man. This was the end of Kuskurza, the third world. De första antropologerna som besökte Hot Villa på 1800-talet var fascinerade av Hopi-indianernas historier om världens undergång. Men indianernas profetier om framtiden hade de svårt att ta på allvar. De lät allt för fantastiska för att vara sannolika. There will be roads in the sky. There will be moving houses of iron. There will be horseless carriages. Okay, it's, uh, daylight outside. Man will have the ability to speak through space. The sacred body of the female will be devalued, indicating that many things will be devalued from the original. Why, why did the white man create all of these things? They make all of these trucks, cars, airplanes. We were warned not to have those, no conveniences. dog Dan Evehema den sista av de gamla Hopi-indianerna som hade upplevt fördrivningen från Oraibi. Han blev 107 år gammal. Idag är det bara en liten handfull Hopi-indianer kvar som fortfarande håller fast vid de gamla traditionerna och försöker försvara Hot Villa mot den utveckling som Massaos profetier varnade för. De gamla fruktar att en ny katastrof kommer att drabba jorden om och när den sista Hopi-indianen ger upp och låter den vita mannens livsstil ta över. The issue is that Hot Villa in the mind of its foundation is a shrine. It's a sacred place where the people live in in loving concert with the earth. Their lives were meant to be lived in that simple way. They treated the earth in a good way, they treated each other in a good way. That was the very foundation and substance of Hot Villa. When these, uh, the government, the tribal council began to push through these so-called improvements of electricity and water, they did not want that. The old people wanted Hot Villa to be left as the sacred shrine. 
Manuel Menunga har beslutat att axla arvet efter sina stolta förfäder. Genom att återgå till hopindianernas ursprungliga livsstil och föra de gamla traditionerna vidare till sina barn hoppas han kunna avvärja den katastrof som han anser hotar oss alla. I decided to give up my truck and I quit my job too because I believe in him. And now I'm into building a stone house and it's almost completed so I can live simple life. I feel sad for the world. There's a lot of people in the world that's gonna get hurt. But they won't listen to me. So things are getting worse out there. Under these mountains, they're just beds of coal. And this coal is being sluiced with millions of year old aquifer under the land here. That coal gets sluiced over to Las Vegas, and which, which is a city that to me is a hallucinogenic nightmare because it's in an unnatural place, it's in a desert, consuming enormous amounts of, of energy, wasting water, a very, very vital resource of the earth that is diminishing. And it's a place to just go hallucinate. Five percent of our body is water. And in order to stay healthy, you got to drink good water. When the European first came here, Columbus, we could drink out of any river. If the Europeans had lived the Indian way when they came, we'd still be drinking out of water because the water is sacred. The air is sacred. Our DNA is made of the same DNA as the tree. The tree breathes what we exhale. When the tree exhales, we need what the tree exhales. So we have a common destiny with the tree. We are all from the earth. And when the earth, the water, the atmosphere is corrupted, then it will create its own reaction. Mother is reacting. In the Hopi prophecy, they say the storms and floods will become greater. Well, I think the hurricanes and the earthquakes and the volcanic action is part of the reaction of the Earth. Wherever there is a disaster, there is a congregation of, of people from all over the world who come to help. I understand the uh, Turkish people were astounded at all the people that descended on them to help at that time. Uh, they bring people together.
to me, it's not a negative thing to know that there will be great changes. It's not negative. It's evolution. When you look at it as evolution, it's time. Nothing stays the same. Sedan Darwin skrev sitt berömda verk om arternas uppkomst har vetenskapen varit övertygad om att människan härstammar från aporna. We always say that might be your ancestor, but it's not our ancestor. He is a relative, but not our ancestor. Medan arkeologerna fortfarande letar efter den felande länken mellan apa och människa har man gjort ovanliga fynd som tyder på att det levde människor på jorden för många miljoner år sedan. I Leitoli i norra Tanzania har man hittat fotavtryck som är cirka 3,5 miljoner år gamla. Och i Nevada i USA har man hittat de förstenade resterna av en över 200 miljoner år gammal sandal. Ett av de äldsta och märkligaste avtrycken är över 500 miljoner år gammalt och liknar faktiskt konturen av en modern sko. De här fynden kan vara svåra att bortförklara, så det är kanske verkligen sant att intelligenta varelser har gått omkring på jorden miljontals år före oss. If we look at the evolution of civilization throughout the billions, the billions of years, our present civilization is called the fifth root race. There is a very strange name attached to it, which unfortunately was preferred by the Nazis. It is called the Aryan race. The race before it, the fourth root race, was called the race of Atlantis. Talrika böcker och artiklar beskriver den sägenomspunna kontinenten Atlantis. Platon skriver att kontinenten hade varit större än Asien och Libyen tillsammans. Men några noggranna upplysningar om var den låg ger han inte. Enligt legenden var Atlantis befolkat av högt utvecklade människor som kunde använda sig av avancerad teknologi. Men deras giriga strävan efter materiellt välstånd blev enligt sägnen deras undergång. Efter en jättelik jordbävning sjönk Atlantis i havet och de få överlevande var tvungna att emigrera till andra världsdelar. I firmly believe there was the civilization of Atlantis with telepathic powers, with connection to space travel, uh, life on, uh, in other galaxies, on other planets. Om det var överlevande från Atlantis som grundade de fungtida högkulturerna i Egypten, Mesopotamien och Amerika kan vi kanske få insikt i deras kunskap om astrologi och matematik genom att studera de gåtfulla pyramiderna i Egypten och Mexiko. Maya epigraphers, those who uh, decipher the Maya hieroglyphic language, are now able to uh, read about 70% of the hieroglyphs. And it's telling us a great deal about Maya culture. Uh, just their architectural achievements alone indicate that they were uh, very sophisticated in terms of engineering uh, huge blocks of stone into place in order for these uh, very subtle astronomical alignments to take place. There is uh, an unknown aspect to that alignment and it indicates that the Pyramid of Kukul Khan is a type of processional star clock. Trappstegen på två av Kukulkan-pyramidens sidor representerar antalet dagar mellan vår- och höstajämningen och markerar på så sätt den tidpunkt på året när dag och natt är lika långa. Då kan man uppleva ett sällsamt fenomen. När solen strålar träffar pyramiden bildas en våglinje av ljus som slingrar sig från pyramidens topp och ner till marken där den träffar ett ormhuvud av sten. The ancient Egyptians and the ancient Vedic cosmology and uh, many other native indigenous belief systems seem to have understood and prophesied about the times when these alignments would be taking place. And many traditions understand procession. 
including the Western astrological tradition, in which we are approaching the dawning of the age of Aquarius. They understand this large cycle as a type of collective human gestation. We are approaching the birth moment in that great cycle of gestation. Humanity will be forced through a gate. We talk about free will, but what free will do we have? We can either go with the process or we can rebel. That's all. Inevitably, we'll have to go with it anyway. It's not surprising to me that the stories of um, transformation of the world, renewal of the world, cataclysm, things like that, are becoming more important in every culture. Those stories were always there, but because of the time that we're in, those stories are becoming important to everybody in a way that maybe they wouldn't have been otherwise. We are the anthropologists studying, constantly studying the white man, the European. If they could see themselves through our eyes, they would see the ridiculous sides, they would see the feudal sides, they would see the mistakes. There is a great conflict building up. International security is a big problem because everybody has a nuclear bomb. Hopi Indianernas profetia innehöll en varning om ett mystiskt kärl med aska som skulle kastas ner på jorden med katastrofala följder. När det hände skulle Hopi Indianerna utföra den uppgift som Massa hade ålagt dem för 900 år sedan. When the atomic bomb was dropped, they knew it was time they had to come forth because forces of evil and destruction were being un unleashed upon the earth. Efter bombningarna av Hiroshima och Nagasaki samlades Hopi-indianernas ledare för att utse fyra representanter som, liksom profetian föreskrev, skulle överlämna en varning till mannen i det vita huset. Profetierna berättade också om ett hus av glas som skulle byggas på Nordamerikas östkust. Här skulle representanter från alla nationer samlas för att försöka lösa världens problem och hit skulle de vända sig om mannen i det vita huset inte ville lyssna på dem. Now in the prophecies they were told they would go four times to the man in the white house and if he turned you away did not invite you into his house then you would have to go to the house of Micah and there are different interpretations how they describe that but who knew hundreds of years ago there was going to be a UN Det skulle gå 44 år innan Hopi indianerna äntligen lyckades göra sig hörda tack vare Charles Lawrence We just called the wife of Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, who was then the, the head of the UN. And it was that moment that of the window being open that we got on the calendar. Thomas Benyaka was the end from the ursprungliga delegationen som levde länge nog för att uppleva den stora dagen. Eftersom delegationen enligt profetian skulle bestå av fyra medlemmar utsåg Thomas Benjaka tre nya representanter och en av dem var Manuel Menunga. In 1992 we went there and we give our Hopi prophecy, Hopi message over there that uh, that was the last warning. If we don't stop these things then the world will get out of balance. But very, very few people showed up to, to witness. Very few countries were represented. And on one hand, it was a shame, but they got in and they, they stood in that place and told their story. We give them four days, four months, four years to come and investigate. But uh, it didn't happen. They didn't come.
The wind never stops out here, you know? And the desert sand never stops blowing. But what happens down the road when there is no water? What happens when these things begin to happen? They're all predicted. And the signs are there. What then? The emergence to the future fifth world has already begun. It is being made by the humble people of little nations and racial minorities. You can read this in the earth itself. Plant forms from previous worlds are beginning to spring up as seeds. Those who take no part in the making of world division by ideology are ready to assume life in the next world. Be they of any race, they are all one. The time is not far off. It will come when the psychosocial Kachina dances in the plaza, representing a blue star which will make its appearance soon. I think we can be of great help in this crisis. Uh, awareness is so important, and the awareness that this is a crisis, but uh, a, and a turning point, a shift, but also a tremendous opportunity that we're, we're entering an entirely new cycle. And all that we can take into it is the best of the old and let the rest of it go. I'm very optimistic and, and enthusiastic about what will come. I think things will be very much different. But I know that we can handle it. Humanic we can all handle it because we have to. <laughs> That's my feeling. Because I think people will pretty soon start making a mental shift. They'll stop feeling like it, they're at the end of something and start feeling like they're at the beginning of something. And that's what I want to be a part of. You should learn how to plant something. That's the first connection. You should treat all things as spirit. Realize that we are one family. It's never something like the end. Just like life, there is no end to life. 